welcome to another lesson of New Creation Fellowship Ministry Training School, our lesson on the kingdom of God. Thank you for being with us. I'd like to open up in prayer. My name is Monica Cummings, and uh, one of the pastors here and one of the teachers. So as we open up in prayer, please follow me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you. Thank you for your great love, your great grace and mercy, and your precious promises in our lives today. May we have eyes to see and ears to hear you, your voice through your word, which all blessings flow. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. And so as we know, and we've had so many great and wonderful lessons here, if you check with the website, you will get a chance to view and hear so many of them that have been before this one. But we begin with talking about the kingdom of God, and we know that Jesus began his public ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, where he teaches repentance, and he says to us, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's in Matthew 4, 17. The king could not set up his own kingdom. And we have discussed this before, and it's a bit of a review. But because the nation of Israel and the government there at that time, they wouldn't, they wouldn't receive him. But that didn't stop him from going about talking about the goodness of God and the kingdom there that God was to share with us if we choose to be in his family and in his kingdom. And as I said before, Israel, they wouldn't receive him. But there were some that did repent and receive him by faith as their Messiah. But the national leaders of Israel, the Romans, nailed him to a cross. Now knowing this, Jesus knew that he was dying for the sins of the world. And he promised to establish God's kingdom on earth. He did as much of that as he could in this three and a half years while he was preaching the gospel and the kingdom of God. But he promised that he would establish God's kingdom and that he would sit on the throne of his glory. And even though we are not living in a kingdom, we are to practice kingdom life in this corrupt world system. And so in doing that, our topic basically today and we'll continue on with one that was, I brought uh, some time ago, where how is a citizen of the kingdom supposed to live? Or how should we live? See, we are citizens of the kingdom. We, first of all, confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Now, if you haven't done that, and you are listening to these lessons from New Creation Fellowship uh, Ministry Training School, you have opportunity to receive salvation and Jesus as your Lord and Savior by checking with our website because there is a prayer of salvation there. But the kingdom of God and, the, and being a citizen of the kingdom and how we should live, we must begin to develop our knowledge of God and the kingdom. And how do we do that? We do that by studying and getting a part of, getting a relationship with the word, to get, getting into the word of God. See, God is love, and so for that great love that he has for us and the love that we share now that we're citizens of God and our Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ, that love will develop our knowledge and it'll give us a yearning and a desire for the knowledge of God. Now, Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, it says in the Amplified that we are Bible that we are to develop our knowledge so we learn what is excellent, what is the best, what is the real values? What is profitable? And we recognize this through God's word. Distinguishing morals, the differences that the word has, and, this, and having Christ in our heart. We develop a character. Having sin, sincere heart, spending time with the word, to know what to do, and not to stumble nor make others stumble. That is developing the knowledge of the kingdom of God, and that's how we should live. So we begin studying out. And as our text scripture 
in our lessons on the kingdom of God, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added. We can go back to where Jesus first said, repent. We go back to where the kingdom of God and, his, and the gospel of the kingdom was preached when Jesus said, repent. So that word, pre- repent, for all of us in, in many, many areas of our life means that is to think differently, to change our mind regarding how we do things, our motives for doing good things, quote unquote, our attitude, the way we look at our pride and the way our conduct and doing what we doing what we know is wrong and doing wrong to get what we want. How we look at things, how we live our life is part of our repentance, how we change our thinking. And that's what that word Repent, change our thinking by embracing and studying the word of God. How God lives is how we should live. For the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what Jesus came about to preach. And so we begin this. First, let's take a look at some of the, the principles and the, the knowledge that is involved in the kingdom of God and, and the citizens who we are. Let's go to a Luke chapter 17 verse 1 and in that in Luke 17 verse 1 it says the kingdom of God is within us and so as we repent our thinking and change our attitudes change the way we live and go about doing things and thinking about how we're going to do things in our life remember that the kingdom of God is within now let's learn a little bit more about the kingdom and how citizens citizens should live. And while we're in Luke, let's go over to Luke 6. Chapter 6, Luke chapter 6. Verse 20. Let's go to Luke 20. Now, in Luke verse 20, while you're going there, let's just say this is part of our attitude, or as they say in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes we learn what citizens of the kingdom are, and we learn that we are truly happy. We are happy citizens of the kingdom. Why? Because in Romans chapter 14, it says that the kingdom of God is also joy, peace, and happiness, and it's righteousness. And so it says in Luke 6, and I like the way it is written out in the the Good News Bible, and I'll read from there, where it says that these beatitudes are says Jesus looks at his disciple now when Jesus is teaching about the kingdom in his time you know he's going around to the seas and the the mountaintops and uh, there's a great multitude following him now when he climbs up on a mountain and he gives starts his sermons and he's preaching now basically it says in the scriptures that he's teaching the disciples he's teaching the disciples and, and these astonishing things comes out of his mouth. And, and people, the, the uh, people are listening, and they're just amazed. The disciples, they're listening carefully, and sometimes they're amazed also. But Jesus, here in Luke 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Happy are you poor, the kingdom of God is yours. Happy are you who are hungry now, happy you will be filled happy are you who weep now you will laugh happy are you when people hurt you reject you insult you and say that you are evil all because of me the son of man be glad when that happens and dance for joy because great is great is a reward that is kept for you in heaven for your ancestors did the very same thing, and they were also uh, insulted. And so what it's saying here is that true happiness is part of our kingdom, is our kingdom attitude. The way we live, we can see right here, it's saying that, you know, everybody's not going to like us. Everybody's not going to be our friend. We're not always going to have all the things that we want in this life. But if we are in the kingdom of God, we can look up and know that there is a reward waiting for us. And our Heavenly Father sees us. 
So in the Beatitudes, we learn that citizens are to be truly happy. So going on, so as citizens of the kingdom, we are the king's subjects. We are not to draw, withdraw from the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Jesus said that we are the salt of the world, the salt of the earth. But if we lose our saltiness, then what good are we? Again, he says that we are the light of the world. And if we put our light under a bushel, then you will not expel the darkness in others around you. Your light does not shine to be seen, but that others may see Christ in you. And so part of this study this, in this lesson, we're going to focus on Matthew chapter 5. So if you're right now, if you turn to Matthew chapter 5, We'll be starting right there in Matthew chapter 5. Now, Matthew chapter 5 does start with the Beatitudes in the King James Bible and m many of the versions of the Bible. I just like the way the Good News Bible says that in, in chapter Luke. In Luke, but, okay, so if we, if we had started in the beginning of chapter 5, we would be saying the Beatitudes, poor, poor in spirit, the mourn, the meek, hungry and thirst after righteousness sake, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. Now, if we continue on and we go to chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And so right here is where Jesus also continues with the development of the kingdom and how the citizens should live. So when you're abused, you turn the other cheek. And this is going to continue on to the end of chapter 5. And, 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 here, and here we're learning that when you're abused, you turn the other cheek. You go the second mile. You pray for those you, and, and you love your enemy. Why? Because you are a chosen generation. You're in the kingdom of God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim and praise him who calls you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we are aristocrats in the kingdom of God. We are children of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we don't want to lose our saltiness or dim our light. The world is in spiritual darkness, binded by the power of Satan and the king of darkness. Live close to Christ and reflect his light. And he is the light of the world. And we're going to go over some of those scriptures that were mentioned right there in the um, verses, those sentences taken from the scripture. But again, in chapter 5, we have the Beatitudes, the believers, and us that are citizens of the kingdom. We are the salt and the light. Also in chapter 5, Christ goes over how he fulfills the law. And he talks about our moral responsibilities and our requirements. He speaks of keeping our word and also turning the other cheek and loving our enemy. And we'll go over some of that. So if we go right on to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, it says in the scripture, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it make salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city, in verse 14, a city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do the people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, we put it on a stand and, give, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others and you'll prompt people to open up with God, open up to God with that is our generous Father. And so this is a, a beautiful a metaphor where Jesus, you know, he talks this way and he, he, he brings in the people and he, he gets them in awe. And, 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 and so it's really saying that we are blessed. We are in the kingdom of God. We are blessed. And we are blessed when we, when we get inside our inside world, knowing these things, knowing that God is 
uh, our Father and knowing that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and he is bringing us into the kingdom of God and his righteousness, when we get our inside world, our mind and our heart, and we get right with him, then others can see God in the outside world and, and us. And so it says in the Message Bible in uh, 513, it says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. And you lose, and if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste the godliness, the good, goodness of God? You'll lose your usefulness and you will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're, you're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, and the public is as in the city and is on the field. And if I make you a light bearer, you don't think that I'm going to hide you in a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a stand, and now you're on the top of the hill, so let your light shine. And so it's just a wonderful thought that you know, once we were in darkness. Now, this is another witness to uh, letting your light shine or putting on that light. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Once you were in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitfulness, fruitless deeds in the dark. Rather expose them. Now that's just, you can just put that down. We're going to stay in Matthew chapter 5, but that is another witness of putting on the light. Putting on the light. I like that when it says that the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now we are the light. Now the fruit will be after we get this in our mind and our heart we start manifesting it and we'll see this in other and actually we should look in the world and when we look in the world we should look for the goodness the righteousness and the truth because what our light is shining on that is shining in the world and so we continue on and uh, now let's just go back there where it says that we are the salt of the earth now we know salt is the chemical salt is a, a mixture of two chemicals two or three chemicals and it says that it cannot cure corruption, but it can prevent decaying from occurring. It is also seasons food, making it palatable to the taste. Similarly, your, our influence as citizens of the kingdom we met, uh, uh, is like salt that checks the spread of corruption. However, if the salt loses its flavor, how can it season? How can it make? How can it be a season? If and then, what good is it? Jesus is warning us not to lose our our ability to be a light in the world in this corrupt world. And so he says that he goes on to say that the light does not shine to be seen, but to enable others to see. And what they are to see is not us as individuals, but the Christ that's in us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, not you, but the glorified God that, that you represent that is in heaven. And Jesus went on to say, it says that a city that is on the top of the hill cannot be hidden, suggesting a city uh, whose uh, street lights and uh, lights in the home shine through the darkness of the night. Now, this is another met metaphor where also you can see the, the church, the church, the body of Christ, which is filled with spiritual light. It comes from him who is light and whom there is no darkness. He also adds, uh, Jesus says, nor shall that lamp be put under a basket or put, uh, uh, we're going to put it up on a lampstand. 
so that all can see, all can see the light. So we are to let our light shine in our homes, in our, on our jobs, everywhere, to light the way to Christ for others. So what it's saying is that as citizens, we continue on. We, we learn, we're studying the knowledge of God and, 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 and the kingdom, how the kingdom, God's way of doing things, and, and we, we do this so that others can see the Christ in us, not for us to get the, any glory, not for us as a person, not for us to be doing good work, but so that they see God in us. Amen? So if we continue on, now, in um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, we'll continue on right there. Jesus came to uh, fulfill the law. So, you know, Jesus walked this earth for 33 years. And even after all those years, those, through those years, he was challenged by many enemies. And he'd always say to his enemies, which of you can convict me of sin? Pilate said to Jesus, I find uh, no fault in him at all because there's, there is only one righteous that is worthy of the kingdom of heaven, and that is the righteousness of Christ, who is the end of the law for righteousness of everyone who will believe. So if we become a citizen of the kingdom of God, and know that it says, as it says in Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. Righteousness. And everything else will be added. For it's with the heart one believes unto righteousness. See, this is a heart matter. Our minds will be renewed, but we will live from our heart in the kingdom of God. So, if we, and, and I like, and in the, the um, you know, Jesus, he goes, he says that uh, he fulfilled the law. And, and we're going to go into that. But remember this, too. In John chapter 8, verse 17, just another witness. Jesus said that I am the light of the world. And he who follows me does not walk in the darkness, but he will walk in the light. And so we know that we need light to live. That's part of, in, in science world, you know, it, it's, it's the photosynthesis of, or whatever it is there that keeps life uh, growing on the planet. And so Jesus says, you need me, you need the light to live, for I am light, and I am the life. So we go about proclaiming, proclaiming Jesus Christ is our master in the kingdom of God. We proclaim that. And because we're all messengers, we're all out here, to, to let our light shine, to let others see us, to let others know that there is a, there's another world system. Not just this world, there's another world system. We are messengers for Christ. And it all started when God said, let there be, light up the darkness, and our lives were filled with the light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ. And, and, and so when we chose Christ to be our Lord and Savior, that's when it all began for us. And if you only look at people and people of even in people believers of in Christ and uh, other citizens in the kingdom, if you just look at people on the outside, the world, other Christians even, you you might miss that brightness. See, we have to go a little bit deeper. We have to know the what we're looking for. We're looking in the heart. We're looking, and so we we look at the message that we're carrying also. And, and, and we have to realize that that message, as we had just read in the scriptures, is we're just, we're just earthen vessels. We're just clay pots. But there is that light of Christ that will shine in us. And so as we were saying in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus might say, and I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. I, I think it, it says it in everyday language here. We, let's just say Jesus might say, that I'm completing God's law. Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures. Even God's law or the prophets, I'm not here to demolish but to complete. I'm going 
to put it all together, put it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky. After, long after stars burn down and the earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. God's law and you will be the only thing that you will realize for yourself. But take it seriously, showing others the way, and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far be better than the Pharisees in the matter of living right, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom or living in it. So we have to realize that God, Jesus' righteousness is our righteousness. He completed the law. And so it goes on, and as we're going through chapter 5, keep in mind we're talking about our citizens should live in the kingdom of God. Now, chapter 5 in Matthew, verse 21, as we continue on, it talks about several, um, it talks about um, how it, it goes on to say there's, um, that we shouldn't commit murder, and we shouldn't even thank murder. We shouldn't even thank it. And so I'm going to continue on and um, discuss some of these scriptures back in, as, as, is, as is written in the Message Bible. And it goes on to say in chapter 5, verse 21. And we'll start there and we'll go down to verse, in the Message Bible, I'll read down to verse 26. Similarly, when, similarly with the command of the ancient, do not murder, it says, I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as anger with a brother or a sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother a idiot or a fool, and you might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you might be on the brink of hell fire. These simple moral facts, this simple moral fact is the word kill. Now, we have to keep in mind that there's different ways uh, of looking at this. Now, murder and the, 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 even the thought or, or uh, just the uh, intent, as he's saying, that it says this is how you want to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter a place of worship, and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember you have a grudge of a friend. And, uh, and uh, so what you should do is you should abandon your offering, leave immediately, leave immediately and go to this friend and make it right with them. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. And so... Here it is, it's putting on our minds what we should do. So it says, and when, or when you cross the street and there's an old men, me, enemy that accosts you, don't lose a minute. Make the first move and make it right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court or maybe even in jail. If this happens, you'll probably have a stiff fine or something worse will happen to you in terms of the world's law. But what is actually is just saying for us to keep in mind that, you know, uh, the thought of, 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 of hating a person or being angry at them or even killing them, you know, it's the thought first. See, God looks at our heart. And that's what it's saying here. As we learn to live and begin to understand the knowledge of the kingdom of God and how important it is, if you commit it in your heart or you call a brother a fool, you know, you, you're, um, that is not what is acceptable in the kingdom of God for a citizen. It's not acceptable. And this is what Jesus is saying. He says it in parables, but at the same time, we know that it is the wrong behavior for the kingdom citizen. And so that part where it was saying about we may end up in court. Now remember, 
that's you could be owing someone or it could be uh, some kind of way you need to uh, apologize to a person or make a correction of something that that was uh, uh, has has been said uh, in the past but remember what Paul said you owe no one anything except to love them so always always remember that part of the kingdom life and part of our kingdom of character is to to love one another and so as it goes on to say um, and this is going to be in uh, we're going to continue on in chapter 5 let's go on and uh, it says about adultery and it says about a divorce and keeping your word and briefly I'll just go over uh, some of these and uh, this is going to be scriptures from uh, mostly from the message Bible but it says that on a, uh, concerning adultery, it says that uh, your heart, in your heart, see, we, we're living from our heart, our faith and our belief in God and all that is righteous. It begins in our heart. So our heart can be corrupt. Did you hear me when I said the heart can be corrupt? Now, we're thinking our thoughts and we we're exposed to so much TV and magazines and all this and movies and a lot of uh, distractions in the world but our heart can be corrupt. Now, in terms of adultery, as it says in 527, it says that the heart can be corrupted by lust quicker than your body. So our body and our mind, that's in our heart. So that is, we keep that in mind. So let's not pretend, this is not an easy thing to deal with when we talk about these subjects like adultery and we're talking about being angry with our, our neighbor and uh, it, so we must remember what it says in the scriptures. And I'm moving down into uh, uh, the scriptures through the Message Bible. In uh, 531, it says, remember the scriptures say, uh, whoever divorced his wife or his, her husband, let him or her do it legally, giving her or him divorce papers and, and uh, the legal rights. Now, two, it says in the Message Bible in 531, too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whims pretending and, and asking this to, to be legal. Please, no more pretending. So it, it isn't right. Marriage, as we know it, is biblical terms, is, a, is sacred and it's binding. And that's what it's, in essence, is saying here. So when we talk about keeping our word, our, our keeping our covenant in marriage, it says this in the Message Bible in Matthew 5, 33. And don't say anything that you don't mean. Don't say anything that you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep into our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay a smoke screen up on what you're trying to say. Now, Think about this, what it says here in the message. It says, when you're pretending to say, I'll pray for you, and you never do it, or you're saying, God be with you, and you really don't mean it. You don't make words true by embellishing them with religious lace and making your speech sound more religious. It becomes less true. Just say yes or say no. When you manipulate words, you get your own, you get in your own way and you go wrong. And so as Jesus continues to talk about how a person is to keep their word, uh, let me just say this one thing too. Now, Jesus did say, and there were several things that he said in, in the book of John on adultery, now, adultery is a sin, but no sin of moral immorality is unpardonable. Jesus forgave the adultery woman, the woman who committed adultery, saying, go and sin no more. That's in John chapter 8. That's a witness to um, uh, Matthew, I think that was 527 we were talking about adultery. And to the Samarian woman who married five times, now living with another man, Jesus revealed 
that he was the Messiah, inviting her to drink the water of eternal life so that she may never thirst again. She may never seek another man of unhappiness and feel. He told her in John chapter 4, verse 1, he told her to continue and know that he would be the last man in her life. So if we continue on, we, we know that Jesus is saying here and, and uh, when he says about keeping her word, he's telling us how to live. And, and I like to just go, go right to when um, he said that our word is our bond. Remember that too. Now that was in chapter 5 when he says, when he speaks on, uh, on oaths or keeping your word, keeping your bond. And don't say words that you don't mean. Because it says that, uh, do you keep your word? Do you keep it when you say, that's my word? Or, or does a person say t to another person about you? She always keeps his, her word. He always keeps his word. That's important. To the honest person, they always say yes and no. There's no gray areas. Truth is truth and a lie is a lie. Even though we may call it just a little lie, it's still a lie. And when the world could catch us up to live about these principles that are in the kingdom of God, most of the world's problems will be solved. When the king of king returns to this earth, he will establish his kingdom. And these principles that are in the kingdom will be obeyed and mankind will learn to tell the truth, God's truth. And that is in the word of God. They will learn to, what is in the word of God. They will, learn, they will know that that is the truth. And as we go on through chapter 5, when we get to five, chapter 5, verse 38. Now remember, always keep in mind, we're talking about living in the kingdom of God. And when it says, turn the other cheek, it says that the believer who has the ability, who has the ability to demonstrate his new life in Christ, because of the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, has been given to us, then we can turn that other cheek. We can do that. We can turn the other cheek. You know, a lot of people are saying in this world nowadays, you know, you can't, you can't live like that. But it says in the word of God and how we live in the kingdom, you shall, Jesus said, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for them in love with a heart filled with the love of God. See, not our love, not the natural love we know. Not what we may think we, it is love, but with the love of God. And you can find a witness to that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Why? Because God, God is love. He, he loves because God loves them and he shows them that love, even in their wicked life. He shines the, the, his light and his love on the evil and the good. He rains, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. But if we love only those who love us, we are no better than the ungodly because we do the same. And even if we love our antagonist and show it by turning the other cheek and going the extra mile, we may suffer persecution, even as the apostles did. They say, respond. The word of God says, respond, rejoicing that they were counted, that we are counted, and the apostles were counted worthy to suffer the shame because of, for the sake of Christ. We practice the kingdom principles by turning the other cheek and loving our enemy because the love of God is in our heart. It fills our heart. And if it doesn't fill your heart, we ask God to help us. And the Holy Spirit, help us to get our heart filled with love. Help us, O oh Lord. You pray that. Pray that. As subjects of the kingdom of God, not only are we to do that, but we are demanded to do that. We go beyond the, the natural laws. So we continue on, and, and so we know that that, uh, that we 
a lot of people, we don't, the, it doesn't seem like we deserve it. They, but we know that because of the love of God, because of that love, we love our enemies. We love those who persecute us, do us wrong. So let us bring out the best in our enemies. Not to, and don't let, don't let them bring out the worst in us. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with energized prayers. For when you are working out, for then you are working out your true selves. We're working out our kingdom selves, our God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best. And so that's what we are supposed to do, to give our best. And in, in a word, it says that we are to grow up. We're kingdom citizens now. We're kingdom subjects. And now we have to live like it. We live out our God-created identity. We live generously and graciously towards others, the way God lives towards us. Amen? And so we continue on. We know that we bless our enemies, not cursing them. We don't laugh at them. We, we, sh we don't share in their sorrows. And we continue to love them. We don't go back at them because that's not what we are told to do in the scriptures. Our scriptures tell us that if we see our enemy hungry, if we see them struggling, we are to go and we are to, to, to encourage them and we are to go and love them. So we are to be responsible. We put on love. We put on love. We put on love. Paul said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, he said, I love God and go right on. If you say you love God and go right on hating your brother or your sister, thinking nothing of it, then you're a liar. If you won't love the person you can see, how can you love God who you can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both the ones that love you and the ones that don't love you. See, there's power in that. There's power in that. There's power in the, these words and these instructions and this knowledge of the kingdom of God here. There's power that we brings into our life. And so we must remember the royal law of love. There's no way we can get around it. And you may want to just jot these scriptures down because without love is impossible to please God. Without love, is, God is love. We can't, we can't be with God if we, if we don't have love. So just put these scriptures down. We'll have another lesson coming up shortly, and uh, our ministers and our pastors will give up on God's love. And, but just remember this, as a citizen of the kingdom and how we should live in Matthew tw chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all their soul, and all their mind. In James chapter 2, you just want to maybe just get the scriptures down. That's Matthew 22, 37, James chapter 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and you do as well. In John chapter 13, verse 37, a new commandment, Jesus said, I give unto you, that you shall love one another as I have loved you, and that you shall also love one another. Now, those three, in Matthew, James, and John, we'll take that in mind because when we say we're in right standing with the kingdom and we have inherited Jesus' righteousness, that is the love, the laws of, the royal law of love. Jesus said, you love everyone as I've loved you. And so that we have to remember. You know, uh, on uh, one occasion, a certain lawyer uh, in Matthew chapter uh, 22, verse 36, uh, this lawyer came up to Jesus and he said, Teacher, which is the greatest uh, commandment in the law? And Jesus knew what his intent was, was to trap him and, and try to confuse the masses that were gathering around. Jesus had taught earlier in his ministry do not think that I came to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. And 
And so Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he went on to say, The second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And when you love God with all your heart and all your mind, and you are obeying the first four of the Ten Commandments. And when you love your neighbor as yourself, you are de de uh, obeying the last six of the commandments. And when you have reached this spiritual understanding, and when you truly love your neighbor as you love yourself, you are practicing this as God's golden rule, as that royal law. And so when Jesus was just talking like this and going about with the parables and these, uh, uh, t the way he was teaching, you know, he, he not only had the, the multitudes amazed, but also the disciples, as we said earlier, because he was teaching as the God man. He was teaching us about the kingdom of God within us and that we could live in peace, joy, and in righteousness. See, God commissioned us. We are the church. We are his body as kingdom citizens, commissioned us to, to, to act in love in all things and to show love to one another. God's love is within us. And that love is to reach out to others. And so in loving God and knowing how we are to live as kingdom citizens, we are to reign in this life. We are kings, and Jesus is the king. We are kings of kings. We are the, the, he is the king, and we are the kings. And so we reign in life, and we know that because of all what he did for us, that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And because of his great the grace and the peace, we are to, and knowing these things and the knowledge of God, we are to live in perfect peace and we are to prosper in all things and have freedom from fears and agitating passions. Because why? Because the, the, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord is multiplied within us in the kingdom. It's multiplied within us. And so for the love of God we, it helps us to control our urges and our impulses and the knowledge, knowing this, and the love of God helps control us also and overcome the world and all that it says in us. And so we are to pro confess these things. We are to say we have power in the words that we say, the scriptures that we say. We, we say that we are empowered to be the righteousness of God. We say these things, and that's what we are. We are the righteousness, and we're made wise because why? Because we read the scriptures and we study and we know what we are to say and to understand because it's right there in the word of God and that's what we say. And as we confess this, knowing that we are the righteousness of God, we knowing that we are the beloved of God, we, it makes God feel good every time we confess these things. I am the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. You are his beloved. It makes God the Father pleased. And when we confess these uh, that we are the righteousness in Christ. It reminds him of what his son has done to make us uh, righteous. It reminds him that how much he loved his son and how much he loves us as much as his son. We are to demonstrate our righteousness at all times. And each time we say, I am the righteousness of God. I am the beloved of God. It brings pleasure to his heart because he suffered and died for us and gave us that right. The Holy Spirit who indwells in us lets us know that we are the righteousness of God. And that pleases him, that it flows in us everywhere we go. And so I just want to remind you of becoming a world-class citizen, a world-class citizen of the kingdom of God. That's good news. That's good news. And so this is taught in every race, every nation, and every language, and that the Lamb of God, Jesus came and died for us to give us this knowledge, this good news, that we can become a part of the kingdom. And we are, as you're listening to this, I'm believing that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. So you pray this, you remember this, and know that to be in Christ and to be a king in the kingdom of God is to be an excellence and to live in the kingdom of God. It is our responsibility 
And in conclusion, I want you to know that the end of things, the end of things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Offering hospitality to one another without grumbling, each one should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others faithfully, administrating God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do so as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do so with the strength of God that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, and in him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. And so don't forget that there is a responsibility. Take this life serious. Fervently stretch out your love and be stewards with your ministerial gifts, blessing others and being a blessing to others. Remember the church in the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world, and we let our light shine among men. We go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Remember, spend time with Christ. Spend time with the Word of God, meditating on the Word. And so as part of our lesson, and you can go to the website to get uh, your lesson that is a part of this, um, your, let's say, your uh, homework and your study questions and your uh, written assignment, you can go to the website to follow this lesson that we just had. You can uh, write down the scripture uh, that God has put in your heart and, and challenge yourself and study these scriptures. Have faith in them and follow through with trusting in the Lord. And so I just want to close in this prayer. I'd like we all to close. Father, May the truths of your word motivate our hearts and our minds every day. Let the word penetrate our hearts and our minds and renew our minds, Father. Then we'll find ourselves thanking your thoughts and speaking your word and acting in faith. And as we take this respon take responsibility to exercise the authority and the power you have given us, we will enjoy more and more the abundant life that Jesus died and was resurrected to provide for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.